you're sleeping till four o'clock in the afternoon. Like something's not right. You need to see somebody. You mentioned your parents earlier. What were their ambitions for you? I think obviously like any parent, they want their kid to be happy. Uh, I think like any parent, they want their kid to be safe and successful and whatnot. Well, there was a reason my mom signed me up for all those after school classes and there was a reason that she made sure I had a book in my hands at all times and made sure I did my homework and made sure that I achieved. And correct me if I'm wrong, but she was the one that saved the money uh, for you to go to Well, yeah, to I mean, Jumper it was her school. kind of nest egg mm -hmm. uh, that when she passed away, that was sort of bequeathed to me. How much do you think, like, th that money and allowing you to go there impacted your life? Immensely. Education is, it's, it's the most important thing uh, in a kid's life. And I got, you know, the Cadillac version of that. Uh, she had her colon removed to feed of, I think, cancerous intestine. Um, ends up passing away in her 30s. You were uh, 10 at the time. And I believe you less remember the death and more remember the impact it had on your family. Um, in what ways? I mean, losing a parent at a young age is, is I think the only, the only worst thing to do is, has, is lose a child, which I, I was watching my, my grandfather and grandmother lose their child, their oldest child. Uh, you know, she's 35 years old. It's too soon. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a terrible way to die. Uh, it just is. And I remember being a little kid, no capacity to process it. It's, it's, a, it's a crater, and your life just explodes, and you, you have to kind of manage it, but you don't know what it's like to mourn or grieve or go through the, you know, the famous sort of processes because you're a kid. You think everything lives forever. So, so you're at University of Texas in um, Austin. Your grandma passes away while you're there. Short time after, uh, your dad ends up passing away. And you said that um, that kind of changed everything and there was this profound sense of being alone. I mean, I had friends and I had you know, sisters, and I had aunts and uncles, but I didn't have a mom and dad. Uh, and I, I give thanks, you know, to the people in my life who, who helped me reorient during that time, which were these really close family friends, um, the Simmonses, the Clarks, and the Wilsons. We got to know his father okay. when he was in high school. His father was adorable and gave us all flowers when John graduated and said, Thanks for being a mother to my son. It was an instinct that we had. We were all just busy, I think, making sure he had support and a little sense of love and community. You know, a loss of a parent is really, really sad at any age, but when you're 20 and you don't have a mother or a father, you just feel like, gosh, got nobody, but he hit us. And they each individually met with me and sort of sat me down and said, like, look, you're going through a hard time. It's okay. You know, well, you, you're, you're going to be okay. You just got to kind of get back on your feet and we'll get you going again. And, and it was profoundly helpful. And um, uh, that's the time at which I, I was, got, into, got into therapy for the first time. My sister was like, you need to see somebody. And what did, what did she say that got you to finally go? Well, she's like, you're... You're, you know, you're sleeping till four o'clock in the afternoon. Like something's not right. You need to see somebody. You're, you're not well. And you know, for me, it was like, I'll be fine. You know, it's like, er, stiff upper lip, kind of Midwestern. Like, don't worry about it. I'm fine. He's not fine. This is not fine. Your friend said even um, when they knew you were struggling, you always had the brave face. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that, I think that's what we're kind of taught as, as whatever, as polite Midwesterners. It's like, don't worry about it, son. Don't want to overshare, fine. But, you know, seeing, seeing the, the therapist at that time was profoundly helpful because it, is, it does what it does. It gives you another perspective on something that you can't quite figure out. And she was able to really kind of... Uh, Again, reorient my, my kind of way of thinking. And she put me on a medication that, was, that changed my brain chemistry enough to where, okay, I'm, I'm feeling a little better. I can, I, I can get up and go to work. I can get up and go to school. I can do my work on time. I can, 
I can, uh, I can self-motivate again. I mean, sometimes that's what you need. And it's like, it's, it's got the most interesting stigma, but you know, people think if you break your ankle, uh, you're not expected to just walk it off. Right. But if your brain chemistry is somehow a little, a little tweaked, you're somehow expected to just deal with it. It's like, well, but there's a medicine that fixes it. And to go back to what you said about the three families that were so helpful, you made the point that it wasn't the therapy as much as the people in your life that didn't have to be kind, but were. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big reason why I, I take meetings with kids that come out here and say, t try to tell them, give them a what's up with moving to LA. It's a big reason why I wanted to go back and teach. It's a big reason why I try to lead with kindness. Because I'm a, I'm a perfect example of what happens when you, when you do that to somebody that you don't need, need to.